we studied Ahimsa, Satyam, and Brahmacharya. And we saw these three terms in the previous essay. And in essence, what it showed us was that by living Ahimsa, nonviolence, Brahmacharya, moderation, and Satyam, truthfulness, we are able to generate peace within and without also. Ahimsa means by creating the least amount of disturbance to anyone. So physically, in the body level, in the speech level, and in the thought level. How is it that I can live my life creating the least amount of disturbance? Because jivaha, jivasya, jivanam means to live, I will have to pluck a fruit, pluck a vegetable. I will have to do certain things like that. Or maybe I might step on an ant or something like that. But how is it that I can live my life to create the least disturbance, to reduce my footprint on the earth? That is called ahimsa. Brahmacharya means to live in moderation, to live with what I have, with what I get, I receive as a result of my actions. It is opposite to greed, wherein we want so much and so much more in this world. And the reason we keep wanting and wanting is because we forget what we have. We only want more because we forget what we have. And that's why brahmacharya means living with what I receive as a result of my actions. And then we saw satyam the need for having some kind of religion, some kind of discipline to be able to ground myself. So that way I follow certain practices, I follow certain things and it puts my life in order. This is how to generate peace within and without. Today we're going to look at essay number four, which is by Puja Gurudev Swami Chinmayana. This essay is called An Inquiry into Peace. Now this looks at peace in a different way, slightly different way. It looks at peace of mind. So when we ask ourselves, what is peace of mind? How is it that we're able to get peace of mind? So first of all, peace of mind is nothing but the mind becoming quiet. How do I know my mind's peaceful? when it becomes quiet. Just check with yourself. Have you ever been at peace when your mind is full of agitations, full of unrest, full of, I have to do this, I need to do that, or I need to do that. It's never at peace. It's always at peace when the mind becomes quiet. Now, what is it that makes the mind noisy? What is it that makes the mind go up and down, up and down all the time? That is what we call the power of desire. So desire is something that causes unrest or agitations in the mind. And we also study this in self-unfoldment. So let's analyze threadbare, what is this desire exactly? What is it? Why is it coming? How is it coming? Is it such a bad thing? And how does it go away? So first, what is this desire? Desire is nothing but a mental thought. It is a thought in your mind. So it's not actually the nature of the self. It is a thought because it comes and it goes. It's fleeting. And guess what? In deep sleep, there are no desires. There are no thoughts. So we peacefully sleep. We are so extremely peaceful. So the very fact that it is a thought and that it comes and it goes, it shows that it's not my real nature. It's not something intrinsic to me. So my real nature is actually desire less. My real nature is consciousness. This desire is nothing but a flash of a thought that comes. Sometimes it stays, sometimes it goes quickly, and it just comes. Now, what is the nature of this thought that comes into my mind? 
Many times in the world, we desire many different things. We desire to be with people. We desire objects. We desire to have certain experiences. And they all look like they're different desires, but actually they're only one desire. And that is the desire for happiness. They are all nothing but the desire for happiness. Why do I want to be with a certain person? Because they make me happy. But the minute they make me sad, then what happens? I don't want to be with them anymore. It's too much. Take a break. <laughs> right? Or why do I want a certain experience? I like to go, maybe months from now, I would like to go on a vacation. You know, to this area, not known, very quaint and quiet. And I desire that experience. But the minute I find out that the Wi-Fi is oh so slow, I don't want to be in that place anymore, right? So, because it's, it's, it's make, not making me happy. Or I desire a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I really want to eat it until I find out that I'm allergic to nuts, so I don't want it anymore. So it's not the object that we're desiring. It's not the person or experience, but actually, Surely, we want to be happy. That's all it is. Because the minute that thing gives us sadness, we don't want it. So now, why is this desire arising? So the desire for everything is nothing but the desire for happiness. But why is this coming? What is the source? This is coming because we are ignorant of who we are. We don't know our real nature. We don't know that our real nature is actually one of consciousness and one of bliss. Our nature is actually of bliss. It's completeness. It's purna. But we don't understand this kind of thing. We don't understand that our nature is actually bliss. And how is it bliss? You see, if you think about it, you and I love that which gives us happiness, correct? So point number one, we love that which gives us happiness. So the, and the more happiness it gives us, the more we love it. So if there's a person who gives us more happiness, we love that person more. If that object gives us more happiness, we love that object more and we take care of that object. So the thing is, we love that which gives us happiness and the more happiness that something gives us, we love it more. Now, point number two is, I love everything for my sake. So I don't love you because you're a great person. The truth is, I love you because you bring me some joy. That's the truth. And if you look at it deeply, it is the real truth. We don't love our children because they're such wonderful, beautiful children. We love them because they give us a sense of security, a sense of joy. We don't love anybody else for their sake. We love everybody for our own sake. This is what the Upanishad says. And if we think deeply, it is true. So therefore, what does that mean? It means actually, I love myself the most. And point number three, I love myself the most means I only love that which gives happiness. So I must be the source of happiness. What I've told you now is, is some points for reflection. It's not something that will come right away, but if you think about it deeply, we will realize that actually it is true. We only love people because they bring us joy. And we only love other people, other things, for the sake of ourselves. And therefore, we love ourselves the most. And if that you only love what gives you the most happiness, then you must be the source of happiness. So, we've forgotten that we are the source of happiness. We don't know sometimes how we are the source of happiness. Perhaps we haven't tasted that we are the source of happiness. Perhaps we just don't believe that we're the source of happiness. 
And because of all of these reasons, we seek the world outside to fulfill us. Now, does the world outside, so we realize that the nature of this desire is because we're ignorant. Can the world outside fulfill us? Can it in any way? Can it bring any temporary peace or relief? Because truly I've experienced some things in the world which have made me smile and have made me peaceful. So maybe the world can bring something. This is what the world is bringing to you. When you have the birth of your newborn baby, and you are overjoyed, what happens? Your mind becomes quiet. Your mind becomes quiet. You can't think about anything else. And your mind is able to reflect the bliss of the self. And hence you feel peace. When you finally move into your apartment, the apartment you've been longing for, and you've set everything down, and your mind becomes quiet. And the bliss of the self reflects on that mind and you feel peace. So what is happening is that that object or that person is not making you peaceful. Your mind just became quiet for a moment. And that very moment your mind became quiet you felt a dash of bliss. It can even happen while eating a slice of chocolate cake. <laughs> Somebody brought you a nice chocolate cake and you were just eating the first bite and oh, your mind became quiet and you felt it. So what's happening is your mind is becoming quiet. That's all. And before you know it, it becomes noisy and noisy and noisy again. So Arishi said, look, if you want to experience happiness in this world, the first thing you need to do, just make your mind quiet. You don't have to go out there and get a desired object or go through an experience or meet a person. Just make your mind quiet and you will feel peace. That's it. Simple as that, easy peasy. So if we want worldly peace, just silence the mind. Now, how long will the silent mind last for? So of course we always can't do things to make the mind silent every day. You know, we can do a few things, but we can't keep doing these practices. At some point, what has to happen is we have to go beyond that very mind. And that process is by becoming desireless and realizing the self. So how do we become desireless? This is the long-term solution. The short-term solution is make your mind peaceful. Chant the mantra. Do some yoga asanas. Put on some music that's going to calm your mind. Take a walk. These are short-term solutions for peace. Long term, how do we become desireless? What is the procedure? One is there are different kinds of desires we've seen. And the first kind is called selfish desires. They are these desires which are for our own sake, for our own self. And they are desires for wealth and for power and for name and for fame and for pleasure for progeny their desires for our own self because maybe we want more comfort we want to look good we you know we have certain, we want attention we want appreciation we want luxury it is all to fuel up this ego which we're eventually trying to get rid of so the first layer is these these barrage of selfish desires that just come into our lives and the thing with the selfish desire is that one 
leads to the other. And before you know it, you're bound. You're bound. You want to buy a property, a house. And so then you have to get furniture. Then you have to get people to move it. Then you have to get people to paint it. And then before you know, you have all this kind of repair. And then before you know it, you have to move to another place. I mean, it is just one after the other. It doesn't end. You desire to have a family. And so you have children, which is wonderful. And then you do raise them. And then you have to go put them through school. You have to put them, make sure they're in college and then they're at work. And it's a beautiful thing. But the fact is that these, these desires don't end. They don't end, especially when we're doing them for a selfish purpose. They can bind us even more. So we have to be careful of what we're really desiring and be careful of these selfish desires because our Upanishads say, whatever you desire, you will experience. In Mundaka Upanishad, there's a very, very beautiful mantra. And it says that whatever you desire, you, it's a, every desire, in essence, is a new birth. You have to go through it. You just have to go through it. You desire to have a family. You go through it. You go through it. You desired it. You desire to find a job and a certain role in a position in the job. You go through it. You desire to live in a certain place. And you have to go through every single thing about that place. Whatever we desire, good luck. We have to go through it. So if you're asking yourself why you're going through what you're going through, or I'm asking myself why I'm going through what I'm going through, we desired it, point blank. And the minute we desire something, you go through it. You go through it, and you go through it to get out of it. Don't go through it to get bound again and again. When we selfishly desire and it increases and it increases, we go through it and we get bound again and again. So how do we get rid of this, of these desires for our own ego, to fuel up our own ego? You turn them into selfless desire. So even that desire of having a job, that's fine. That's a great desire, but not to fuel up my ego so I can have so much luxury and so much wealth and flaunt it to everyone. Then we're getting bound by our desire. When you make it selfless, like, yes, I desire to have a job because you know what? I want to use this to contribute to the world. I want to be able to use my ability and talent to bring positivity or change to the world. Then you are getting out of that desire. You're growing out of that desire as opposed to falling into it even deeper. When I desire to have a family, fine, have a family. But then what happens is when my desire to have a family is so that I can look good. And that's so my children should be like me. And, you know, they should be mini me's. Oh, then I'm getting bound again. Oh, good luck. You go through all that, oh, you know, like that sadness that the kids are not following you. They're not being like you. They're being like somebody else. It's just a major thing you have to go through. But if your desire is that I'm going to have a family and I want to nurture wonderful children so that they can be positive contributors to society. So maybe by whatever I can do, this will be my gift to society then you're growing out of that desire. So when we take that desire and we make it or use it to fuel our ego, we get further bound. We get agitated. We get restless. We get upset because no one's really meeting what we want. But when we take that desire and make it selfless, then it becomes a more beautiful experience because you're solely concerned about what you're giving and not about what you're getting. And that, that, that switch of the mind can bring you great amount of peace. 
And what's more, when we selflessly desire, we learn how to expand further. We learn how to embrace, to expand. That ego becomes diluted. So the example that Puja Gurudev gives is like, think of your ego like salt and think of your ego in a cup of water. What happens in a salt in a cup of water, it tastes very salty. So when you and I are serving in small means, realms, there's still a lot of ego there. But you make the cup bigger, make it into like a cooking pot. Put some salt, a pinch of salt in a cooking pot and the ego is again diluted. So you're able to expand a little bit more and your ego gets diluted. Now think about expanding to a tub of water, how much your ego will get diluted. So when we take on to selflessness, the more we expand, the more diluted the ego becomes. And this expansiveness is key to realizing our true nature. Because if you and I cannot identify with everyone, identify, see oneness and all and serve all, it's very difficult to realize the truth. So when I'm able to make this switch, and it could be the same thing, you know, it could be the same family, it could be the same job, it could be security, it could even be money. If your desire to make money, you can see it in two ways. You know, if it's for your own luxury, comfort, you will get bound by it. How many actors, actresses have we seen becoming billionaires and they get depressed and then they get into drugs and something happens and something else happens. But if you want to make money and you're sharing it with other people, do it. What a wonderful thing. What a noble thing. You can really make a difference then. So slowly we move into this phase in life where we're focused more on giving than getting. And that will give us a great sense of peace. After some point in time, when we are selflessly giving, what happens is that desire for the self comes. That desire to know the truth comes. It comes when you become ripe and you really want to know the truth. And once that desire comes, that is the most beautiful and noble desire that you can ever entertain in your life. If you want to know the top most desire to have, it's the desire to know who you are. That is the desire. Because that desire will help you drop all desires. What a beautiful thing, huh? That desire to know the self, that desire will help you drop all desires. So if I have that desire to know the self, that's the most beautiful thing. Pursue it fully and completely because actually, that's the purpose of life. Everything is just getting you ready to have this desire. Your whole life is getting you ready just to have this desire. And if you have it, nurture it. Let it grow through satsang, etc. Because then, once the self is realized, what happens? We become desireless. And when you become desireless, then only there is lasting peace. That is what will truly bring peace. What is, how is a person becoming desireless? Why are they desireless? Number one, because they are so full of that contentment within. They are so, like, they're just residing in it. They're just abiding in it. So they won't even want anything outside. You know, once you eat your mom's dal chawal at home, right? 
you eat it and it's really yummy. I mean, it's just dal and it's just rice, but it's the way the mother makes it, which makes it dal rice, right? When you eat that dal chawal, you're not gonna want to go to a restaurant to order dal chawal anymore because it's just not the same. It just doesn't cut it. So when you've gotten this sense of peace arising from fullness, you don't want the world anymore. It's like for a millionaire, are they gonna want 10 bucks? If you tell them, join this competition and you'll win $10, they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? I have a million bucks. <laughs> it's okay, you keep your $10, right? So the way a realized person thinks is, you keep your little bitty, you know, pleasures to yourself because I'm full. I don't want anything anymore. And I'm reveling in that. That's the way they feel. And therefore, they have peace. Another reason is that they've come to realize that there's nothing other than themselves. There's no other being because the whole world is them. The whole world is them. Everything is them. So what else can they want? There's nothing other than them. So guess what? If my best friend got like a, if my best friend got a baby girl and I didn't get a baby girl, that's okay because you know what? My best friend is me. We're the same person. So I'm so happy. The whole world is them. It's them. It's not someone different. So they just, they don't think that anything is other than them. And lastly, that very desirer, that very ego is broken. There's no one to desire. They've transcended that ego because they've realized the self. So who can desire what? And in this, they find lasting peace. So if you and I are wondering how to come to peace, this is the pattern. Hmm? So what have we seen today? We've seen today that there is actually our nature is peace. But this agitation in our mind is caused by something called desire. And this desire is not our real nature, it's a thought. It's a thought, it comes and it goes. If it were our real nature, it would be there all the time. And this desire, although it feels like it's of different things and of different people, it's actually nothing but the desire to be happy. And I know that because the minute that object or person makes me sad, I don't want it. And the reason why we have this desire is because we're ignorant of ourselves. We don't know who we really are. Or sometimes we don't understand that we are true bliss. So what do I do? Number one is there's this type of desire, which is selfish desire, come out of that because it is never ending. It, it gets me bound deeper and deeper and deeper. And all it is trying to do is fuel my ego. So get rid of that. Chuck it out. And transform it into something selfless. Transform the getting into giving. And it's the same thing. You want a family? Go for it. You want to make money? Go for it. You want to start a business? Go for it that make the motive selfless. Make the motive about giving. And this will give us a greater sense of peace. And once we come to that level, a desire for the self will slowly start to arise when we become purer and purer. And when that desire comes, roll with it. Go with it, fulfill it. Because that desire will help you drop all desires and you attain desirelessness. 
wherein you are ever full, ever free, and you don't want anything because there's nothing else to want and there's no one else to want. You are ever at peace. Clear? You desire something selfishly and you don't get it, that is called anger. So it's an obstruction to your desire. So when you, when someone becomes angry, then, you know, the first way to deal with them or guide them is just to keep them peaceful, just to, just to take a walk or just drink some water, just let them calm down and slowly, slowly make them understand that nobody gets every single thing they want, right? Have you and I met anyone or who's gotten every single thing that they want? No, we haven't. So anger is nothing but an obstruction to a desire. So if you and I understand that in life, we're just not going to get everything that we want and it's okay, then that anger will slowly, slowly subside. It will slowly let go. Be, they'll slowly be able to let it go. Does that make sense, Manisha? Good. Um, what role does gratitude play? Right. So gratitude is something that's extremely important. So when we have desires, right? Again, why we're desiring so many things is we, because we forget what we already have. So gratitude is a very powerful tool to analyze what we already have and be grateful for it. Now that doesn't mean that you can't aspire more, but you can aspire to give more, not to get more. Hmm? This contentment, gratitude is always a funny thing because people say, well, if you're content, then you won't strive for anything, right? So where do you strike the balance? Where you strike the balance is, be content with what you get, be grateful with what you get, but don't be content with what you can give. So always aspire to give more, to be more, to do more, but be grateful with what we get. And that gratitude about what we receive as a result of our action will give us immense peace. Page all clear? Um, yes, prohibitive desires. Yes, Manisha was reminding me to mention prohibitive desires, selfish desires, selfless, and then divinize. So the step that I usually tell them uh, when I talk about desire is, you know, the first thing to do is to really give up prohibitive desires. These desires which we should not entertain, you know, which are not shastriya, which will harm other people, which will harm ourselves. That's the first step. And the second one is to give up selfish ones. The third one is from selfless desires to start to divinize the desire. And that desire then will come culminate in the desire for the self. And then you're on your way. You're on your way to a higher path. How do you differentiate success from wanting to have a greater impact as a whole? So, what success means in Vedanta is a very different thing. Success doesn't mean, you know, name, fame, and all of that. Success is how much have I grown closer to my divinity? How much have I come towards realizing myself? The closer that I've come towards realizing the self, the more successful I am. So this success of like, you know, name and this, I did this, I did that, that doesn't mean anything in Vedanta. What matters is, are you close to realizing the self? In our Upanishad, Keno Upanishad, it says, Yachev avedid atasatyamasti. Nachev yavedid mahati vinashti. Means in this life, if I have realized the truth, satya, that is good. If I have not put forth effort to realize the truth, that means my life is not worth it. That means I'm, I've lived a worthless life because I have not even put forth effort to realize the self or to fulfill the purpose of life. I've done everything else. 
I've done everything else, but I didn't even put forth effort to realize the self. Then that is definitely not successful. Hmm? Okay. Yes, yes. In answer to your question, Manisha Ji, yeah. It, prohibitive desires can filter many of the selfish desires. Yes. Yeah. Um, one last question I will take. Going by the fact that we all, that all we love is for our sake, as I am the source of my own happiness, is there really anything called selfless love? How is this different from realization? Very good question. The true fact is, even how selfless we are, we are still selfish. It's a fact. Even if we're into selfless work, the real thing is that it pleases us. It gives us happiness. So everything that we're doing is only because it's giving us happiness. But now, the one who has realized the self, there is no I. So they take everyone to be the same. That kind of love that a realized master has is completely selfless because they've dissolved their individuality. They're not loving you because you make them feel good. They're not loving you because they need it. They're so full. They're loving you because you are them. They are you. We are one. That's it. And if at all they can do anything to help you evolve, they'll do it. But there's not even an inkling of wanting anything from you. Besides the fact that you grow. Besides the fact that you evolve. And that's why the most beautiful love is the love of Bhagavan or the love of the Guru Parampara. But they don't want anything. They don't want anything from you. Hmm? Tell me, can you truly love someone without wanting something from them? Can you? If you can, then you realize it. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay, one last question and then I will have to go. Why is the last step selfless to divinize most difficult and what are the tools to walk that? So why is the last step selfless? So when you, you know, selflessness, right? When we do selfless action, divinizing means that you offer it to Bhagavan. You know, like it's not, again, you know, in selfless action, there can be like an ego. Like, you know, I do so much selfless work. I do so much charity. I do this, this, say that. So even that ego in selfless work has to go. So therefore, divinize. So even if I'm serving, it's Bhagavan only. It's Bhagavan's work and Bhagavan is working through me. It's not, I've got nothing to do with it. And this is a difficult path. But what are the tools to walk that? I will mention next week because I won't be able to tell you in one minute. I won't do it justice. Okay? Okay. 